In this topic, we're going to be talking about the metals um, a little bit in general, and then we're going to start talking about the transition metals specifically, because those are the ones that we're going to be looking at in coordination compounds. So we have here the periodic table just to review. Where are the metals in the periodic table? The majority of the elements in the periodic table are classified as metals. We have highlighted here in purple, those are the metalloids. In green, we have uh, the non-metals, including hydrogen in group one. I have numbers from one through eight in orange. Those numbers are representing the main groups in the periodic table. So everything that I left in white, it's a metal, it's the majority of the elements. Also, we have the inner transition metals right there, the lanthanides and the actinides. We have them on the bottom of the periodic table. They are also metals. So some properties of metals in general, they're good conductors of electricity and heat. They can be shaped into sheets. That's how we get um, aluminum foil, for example. They're ductile because we can actually shape them into wires. They're often shiny. And an example of a chemical property of metals is that they will always be losing electrons in chemical changes. So the metals are going to be forming positive ions or cations. Now, metals can also form metallic bonds. We know about ionic bonds where the metals are losing electrons, the non-metals are gaining electrons, and then the attraction between the opposite charges will form this ionic bond. But we also have metallic bonds. You can have bonds between metal ions, but for this type of bond, what is happening is that the metals are going to be donating the electrons and the electrons are going to form a pool of electrons. So you have your positive ions, which are the metals, surrounded by this pool of electrons around them to avoid the repulsion between your positive ions. So in the diagram, the positive charges are representing the metals. They're forming the positive ion because the electrons are being donated to form this pool of electrons. So you have the positive ions and then this circle around them, blue, it's representing that pool of electrons that is being formed from those valence electrons that the metals are donating to create that pool of electrons in order for that metallic bond to exist. From the metals that you have listed on the periodic table, only a few of them are actually metallic elements that you can find them by themselves, pure elements in nature. Those are nickel, copper, palladium, silver, platinum, and gold. The reason why these specific metals, they do exist in nature as metallic elements is because they are, um, the reactivity for them is very low. Since they are not very reactive, they like to be by themselves. That's why we can find them pure in nature. Now, the other metallic elements, they're usually part of a mineral. So we have listed here some examples. There are many others. Okay? I just find, found some of them and I added them here in your presentation. The first two are oxides containing iron, containing titanium, both transition metals. And then we have for the last two, we have a metal containing copper and another one containing cobalt. So metallurgy, it's a process that comprehends 
everything that happens when you find these metallic elements as part of minerals. So minding them, extracting them from the minerals, purifying them, and then finally having your pure metals to use in other applications. Now, something very important is that we know about these substances that I have listed here at the very end, brass, steel, and bronze. All of them are metals, but you don't have them in the periodic table. They don't exist in the periodic table because they're actually alloys. These alloys are solutions. They're solid solutions. This is the best example that we can use to explain what a solid solution is. A, so a solution, it's a homogeneous mixture, right? And when you have a solid solution, all of the components in that solution are solids. So you have brass, which is um, an alloy composed mostly of copper, and it has zinc and other metals in there, but the majority it's copper and zinc. We have steel, which the major component is iron. You have some carbon, nickel, cobalt, and other metals in there also in that specific alloy. And then the last one that I have listed is bronze. And in that one, you have mainly copper and you have some tin and um, minor components of some other metallic elements in there. I'm going over electron configuration for transition metals or electronic configurations. So transition metals are the elements that we have between the S block in the periodic table and the P block on the periodic table. So your S group one and group two, where you have hydrogen, lithium, and group two, beryllium, magnesium, and so on. And what you have on the P block starting with brom boron and all the way to your noble gases. So those transition metals are transition elements because they have electrons in the orbitals. So we have S, P, and the orbitals, and your S and P orbitals are being used to write down electron configurations for the main groups. And now the D orbitals are being used to write down electron configuration for the transition metals. Transition metals um, are the ones that I have highlighted in blue in the periodic table label as the D block. And we have the inner transition metals, which are your lanthanides and actinides, the ones that are in purple. You have two different shades of purple for those. So we're going to be um, looking at the transition elements, not the inner transition elements. So your transition metals, they share the same properties as the metals in the main group. They are good conductors of electricity and all the other properties are the same. Now, besides having D electrons, which is something that is different between transition metals and the metals in the main groups, the transition elements, they are going to have ions with multiple charges. So we know what ions are, right? negative or positive, depending on how many electrons you have. Right? You have your ions, they're atoms for the same element, but with different number of electrons. Elements in the main groups, they're going to form ions with a specific charge. In general, it's the same. But for transition elements, they can have multiple ions with different charges. And you will see some examples later. Just to review, we have the different types of orbitals, S, P, and D. So we have seven energy levels that are given by the periods on your periodic table. So starting with period one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Seven periods, seven energy levels. 
So your different orbitals, we have S orbitals starting in the first energy level. So your first energy level has just one S orbital. Then we move to the second energy level, and in the second energy level, we have S and P orbitals. So for your S orbitals, it's always one of them. For the P orbitals, we have three of them always. And then we move to the third energy level. And on the third energy level, we have three different types of orbitals, S, P, and D orbitals. For your S orbital, it's always one of them. P orbitals, it's always three of them. And then for the D orbitals, we have five of them. In each orbital, we can assign up to two electrons. So when you have one S orbital, you can have S1 or S2, no more than two electrons. When you have electrons in P orbitals, since you have three of them, you can have from one electron all the way to six electrons. You have three P orbitals and you can put up to two electrons in each one. So we can go from P1 all the way to P6. And finally, we are on the D orbitals, the ones that we're using for the electron configuration for transition metals. For D orbitals, we have five of them. So the number of electrons in the D orbitals can go from D1 all the way to D10. So when we look at the periodic table, we have the S block on the left where you have your group one and group two. And then we have the P block on the right side where we have group three all the way to group eight. So we have S1, S2, and then we have on the right side P1 all the way to P6. Now the D block where we have the transition metals for the D orbitals we can accommodate in those D orbitals from one electron all the way to 10. So if you check your periodic table right here, if we start right here, that will be D1, D2, D3. D10. So that's why this is the D block in the periodic table. We have five D orbitals. In each one we can put up to two electrons. And that fits in that part that we have highlighted in blue in your periodic table. To write down the electron configuration for transition metals, we're going to use the short notation. Okay? So you should review the steps to write down the short notation. For transition metals, we actually have a generic notation that we can use. We're looking at transition metals in the fourth and in the fifth period. Okay? So the fourth period in the periodic table is where you have potassium crossing all the way to the other side where you have krypton. And then the fifth period we have rubidium right there crossing all the way to where you have xenon. So for the short notation, if we're looking at the fourth period in the periodic table, like the noble gas that we have before will be argon. Okay, so it's the noble gas that we have on the on the third period, the one that we're using. So I'm looking at this notation right here. For the fourth period, we're going to write down the electron configuration for all of the transition metals in that fourth period following the notation that I have right there. We're using argon as the noble gas in brackets. And then that will be followed by 4s2, 3dx. You see how my x is in green, which is the same color that I'm using to label my d block in the periodic table. The x represents how many electrons you have in that d orbital and the d orbitals for 
a specific transition element. So, for example, if we're looking at scandium, which is number 21, electron configuration for scandium is going to be argon, 4s2, 3d1. If we move to the fifth period, for example, now I'm looking at this one down here. The noble gas is changing, right? Because now, if we're looking at elements in the fifth period, we're using the noble gas that we have on the fourth period, which is going to be krypton. So I have krypton in brackets. Then I have 5s2, 4dx. That x, again, represents the number of electrons that you have in the d orbitals for that specific element. So we can actually look at the periodic table to assign how many electrons you have in those d orbitals. If we're looking at zirconium right there on the fifth period, number element number 40, you see how in your periodic table you have d2. So for zirconium, you have electron configuration will be krypton, 5s2, 4d2. The 2, it's coming from the number that you have in the periodic table. So I'm going to write down the one for zirconium and titanium on the fourth period. So for this one, You see how zirconium is right under titanium. For both of them, what I have is D2. Now, something that we need to remember. Electron configuration for argon. I have that one right here. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. You have a total of 18 electrons right there. On the third energy level, we have three types of orbitals. Remember, the number for your energy level always tells you how many types of orbitals you have. First energy level, one type, which is S. Second energy level, two types, S and P. Third energy level, three types of orbitals, S, P, and D. So for argon... For argon, right there in your periodic table, period 3, right? the last electrons that we have for argon go, they're going on the third energy level, which is the highest one, S orbital, P orbitals. So you see, argon is the last element in the main group that has electrons in your third energy level. After that one, we're moving to the fourth period in the periodic table. So we're going to put electrons in the fourth energy level. On the fourth energy level, we have four types of orbitals. S, P, D, and Fs. So after argon, we move to element 19, which is potassium. In potassium, you have electrons in the fourth energy level. Period 4, 4, orbital S, 4S, and 1 electron to go from 18 to 19. Then we move to calcium, and that one will be 4S2. Then we have the first transition metal right there, which is number 21, scandium. So for scandium, you see how for argon, we're filling the S and the P orbitals, but not the D orbitals. The D orbitals on the third energy level, they are empty. So for scandium, we're not going to put electrons in the 4D orbital because we still have the D orbitals on the third energy level that are empty. 
so there's um there's an explanation on why we go from the 4s back to the 3ds but the easy explanation right the one that we're using is that we have those d orbitals empty since they are on the third energy level those d orbitals are empty now for scandium we're going to start scandium it's in the d block in the periodic table so we're going to start placing electrons in those d orbitals but not on the 4d because we still have to use the d orbitals on the third energy level so for scandium instead of having 4s2 4d we're using the d orbitals on the third energy level that's why the electron configuration for scandium will be argon 4s2 3d1 your s and p orbitals are always on the same energy level for argon the one that i have right there you see you have 3s2 3p6 s and p on the same energy level you have 2s2 2p6 s and p on the same energy level but the d orbitals are always in a lower energy level when you're looking at transition metals in period four s and p orbitals are on the fourth energy level but d orbitals are on the third one we move to the fifth period on the periodic table s and p orbitals are on the fifth energy level but the d orbitals now are on the fourth one if we move to the sixth period on the periodic table your s and p orbitals are on the sixth energy level but the d orbitals are on the fifth one so it's always one lower energy level for the d orbitals so you can use your um, notation here for the electron configuration for transition metals on the fourth and fifth period to write down manganese and technetium okay, manganese 25 and then we have technetium right under remember the number of electrons that you're adding on the d orbitals is coming from the periodic table but not just for transition metals for any electron configuration that you're writing down you should check that the number of electrons that you're writing corresponds to the total number of electrons that you're trying to accommodate in your orbitals what i mean is for titanium atomic number 22 so you have 22 electrons when you're writing your electron configuration you should check that you're actually writing an electron configuration for 22 electrons so if you check the electron configuration that i have here for titanium i have 18 electrons here for argon plus two electrons here in my 4s2 that's 20 plus the two d electrons that i have right there in green that adds to 22. for zirconium we have krypton with 36 electrons plus two electrons in the s orbital that's 38 plus two that's 40 which is the total number of electrons that we're using for zirconium atomic number 40 40 electrons so when you're writing down your electron configuration for manganese and technetium make sure that when you're done the number of electrons that you have corresponds to the atomic number for the elements so i'm going to write down here the the notation that i'm following to write down this electron configuration for your transition metals so for the fourth period and for the fifth period So I have 
chromium, which is number element number 24, right on the periodic table. So if we want to write down the electron configuration for chromium, which is in period 4, I'm going to use my notation right as it is. So I'm trying to get to 24 electrons, right? So I have argon, that is already giving me 18. And then I have two more in the 4S, that's 20. And I need to get to 24. So in your D orbital, we need four electrons. So that will give you 24. So let's write down for copper. Copper is element number 29, and I have copper in the fourth period again. So this is 20 electrons right here. Argon plus 2, argon is 18 plus 2, 20, and I'm trying to go from to get 29 electrons, which is the atomic number for copper. So that will be 3D9. Now I'm writing down the electron configuration for chromium and copper because the actual electron configuration for chromium and copper is different from what we can predict with the notation that you have. These are exceptions, not the only two exceptions that you have both the only two that you're responsible for knowing okay. both of them are in period four so these are two exceptions on period four in your in your periodic table so the correct electron configuration for chromium It's going to be 3d5 remember you have 5d orbitals in each one you can put up to two electrons so the maximum number of electrons in the d orbital is 10 halfway it's five electrons so the the atom of copper instead of having 4s2 3d4 it will be more stable when it actually has a half full d orbitals so let me write down your orbitals using lines that will be your s and that's your d if i have five electrons here all of them will be on pair following Hund's rule, one electron per orbital until you don't have any more empty orbitals and now you have to pair the electrons. So I have my five electrons right there in the D orbitals. So for chromium, the actual experimental electron configuration that it's determined is not d4 it corresponds to a d5 now if you have five electrons in the d orbitals for chromium right and argon is 18 so when you add up your 18 plus 5 right, that's not giving you the same number that you have for the atomic number of chromium which is 24 so you have 18 plus 5 which is only 23 electrons for chromium, you need to have 24. That's your atomic number. So 24 electrons, it's four S one. So in that four S orbital, you have one electron. So you have D five, right? D five, 
starting with D1 right here. If we use this periodic table label from D1 all the way to D10, D5 corresponds to manganese, not chromium. Right? D5, it is for manganese. Everything in that column right there for manganese, technetium, rhenium, all the way down is D5. Now we have for chromium D5. So the difference is the number of electrons that you have in the S orbital. Chromium is not for S2, right? it's for S1. For you to have 3D5 for chromium, your number of electrons in the S orbital has to go down by one. If you're increasing the D electrons by one from D4 to D5 to have this half full D orbitals, you need to decrease the number of electrons in the S orbital by one because we're not adding or taking electrons away. They're just moving from one orbital to another. So for chromium, you have 4s1, 3d5. That is the correct electron configuration. For manganese, you still have d5, but it's not 4s1. For manganese, since it's not one of the exceptions, you do have 4s2 and then 3d5. Let's look at Copper. You can pause the video and try to come up with the correct electron configuration for copper based on what you have for chromium. So for copper, if we use the notation that you have, argon for S2, 3d9 right that's what we get but i already told you that that's not the correct one copper it's another exception so we have argon and then the d orbitals for copper instead of having d9 we have all 10 electrons so you see for chromium we have half half full for chromium d5 that's half of 10 but for copper we're going to have a completely full d orbital so you have five of them and you can go from one to ten so your d orbitals are completely full with 10 electrons so that's what we have for copper instead of being d9 we have 10 electrons Ten. If we're going from D9 to D10, right, we still need 29 electrons. That's the total number of electrons. In your S orbital now, you have just one electron. So your two exceptions, chromium and copper, the difference is that your D orbitals in chromium are half full with five electrons. Since we're increasing that number of electrons in the d orbitals by one, we have to take one electron from the s orbital. And then for copper, your d orbitals are, are completely full with 10 electrons. So since we're going from d9 to d10 to have that full d orbitals, now your 4s is not 4s2, it will be 4s1. So in your periodic table, sink, it, it is D10. For zinc, you do have 3D10. The difference between your copper and zinc is that for copper, you have 4S1, and for zinc, you're going to have 4S2. Copper with 4S1, 3D10, you have 18 electrons for argon, plus that one right there is 19 
plus 10 right here is 29. A total of 29 electrons which matches your electron configuration. For zinc, since you have 4s2, right, you're not going to have 29, you're going to have a total of 30 electrons. Now, looking at transition metals and how the electron configuration for transition metals is going to work. We have our notation for the fourth and the fifth period, which are the ones that we need to know. Fourth period, argon for S2, 3dx. And remember that X is the number of electrons that you have in those D orbitals for transition metals. So iron is element number 26 in the periodic table. So you have 26 electrons. So we can write down the electron configuration using our notation right there. This will be argon. And since the atomic number for iron is 26, I'm going to write down my atomic number right there, 26. I have 18 here for argon plus 2, that's 20, which means that in my d orbitals, I'm going to have 6 electrons. That will add up to 26. Remember, you need a total of 26. So this is 18, 2, and 6, that's your 26 electrons. Now, when we're writing the electron configuration for iron plus 2, And I'm going to write down that one right here. Iron plus 2. For iron, you have 26 electrons. When you have iron plus 2, you don't have 26 electrons. Iron, the atom of iron, neutral. Neutral. The neutral atom of iron will have 26 electrons. But your iron plus 2 means that it's losing 2 electrons. So now you don't have 26. You will have 24 electrons. That's the total number of electrons for iron plus 2. So it's losing 2 electrons. That electron configuration that I just wrote, it contains 24 electrons, right? You have 18 electrons right here for argon. That's 2. And this is 4. And that will add up to 24 electrons. But that electron configuration is not correct. Valence electrons are the ones that are being transferred. Valence electrons are the electrons that you have in the highest energy level. If you look at your electron configuration for iron, no charge, the neutral one, you have argon, 4s2, 3d6. Your s electrons are in the fourth energy level that will be the highest energy level the fourth one 3d orbitals your d orbitals are always in a lower energy level so your electrons in the s orbital are in the fourth energy level which is the highest one so when iron plus two it's losing two when iron sorry when iron it's losing two electrons to become iron plus two the two electrons that iron is losing are the electrons in your fourth energy level which is the highest one. 
so you have 18 electrons and then you have six electrons and that will give you 24 electrons that is the same as having argon 3d6 also 24 electrons so when your transition metals are losing electrons to form your ions and it's always losing because they're metals and the metals are always losing or giving electrons away transition metals will always lose the s electrons first because the s electrons are always in a higher energy level than the three than than the d electrons when you're writing the electron configuration for iron plus three now we go down to 23 electrons we have 26 losing three will go down to 23 The first two electrons are being removed from the fourth energy level, which is the highest one. And then to go down to 23, we're going to have 3D5. that's 18 electrons plus 5 electrons that gives you 23 electrons so now try to write down the electron configuration for zirconium and zirconium plus 4 